everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Pixel Streaming Using Unreal Engine Next Gen 3A on the web. My name is Anjali and I will be hosting today's webinar on the behalf of Working Tree Technologies. I am thrilled to have you all with us today. We have got an engaging session ahead where we will explore into how Pixel Streaming with Unreal Engine brings Next Gen 3D experiences to the web, improving accessibility and performance. Before we move further, let's take a quick second to welcome those who have just joined us. For those of you who are new to working through technologies, a big warm welcome. We are a company that lives and breathes innovation, constantly pushing the limits of what technology can achieve. We specialize in cutting edge tech solutions, especially in artificial intelligence and open source frameworks. Our mission is clear to equip businesses with state-of-the-art technologies that drive efficiency, scalability, and innovation. Uh, we also hold expertise in pixel streaming using Unreal Engine, which redefines 3D content delivery by providing seamless and Im immersive experiences directly through web browsers. This technology modifies across uh, to access to high quality 3D environments, making them accessible to a global audience without the need for specialized hardware or software. Uh, today, we are focusing on pixel streaming using Unreal Engine. Pixel streaming allows users to interact with rich interactive 3D environments directly through uh, their web browsers. This technology not only uh, improves accessibility, but also expands the reach of 3D solutions to a global audience, making them more accessible than ever. By leveraging uh, Unreal Engine's capabilities, we deliver unparalleled visual fidelity and performance, ensuring users have a seamless and emerging uh, experience across all industries. This webinar aims to demonstrate uh, the power of pixel streaming and its potential to redefine how we consume 3D content on the web. Throughout this session, we'll uh, also cover deployment strategies cloud architecture, network latency reduction, and the future of web-based 3D solutions. Get ready to see how Unreal Engine can bring significant value to, uh, to your organization. We hope you leave uh, today's webinar with a new ideas and actionable strategies to apply in your own organization. Uh, we, want to, we want this webinar to be an engaging and interactive as possible. So feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box at any time. And if somebody really resonates with you or, or you have a, a thought to share, use the chat feature. So let's make this dynamic and informative, inter, informative discussion. So let's start with a small question. How many of you have implemented 3D solutions in your web projects before? What challenges did you face? By the time you answer this in the chat box, let me introduce our speakers for, the, for today's session. So, uh, firstly, we have Scott Seaboot, the CTO of Walking Tree Technologies. With over 30 years of extensive experience in engineering enterprise computing systems, Scott is now dedicated to advancing pixel streaming for Unreal Engine, along with other cutting edge technologies. Throughout his distinguished career, he has contributed to phases of software development lifecycle. This includes everything from initial ideation and design to development, rigorous testing and seamless implementation, and ongoing support. His comprehensive expertise and innovative approach continue to drive technological progress and excellence in the field. Next, we have Fanny Kiran, uh, the principal architect at Walking Tree Technologies. With over 15, over 14 years of experience, he excels in web and mobile application development, ERP product development, and technologies like Java, Node.js, and uh, blockchain. Currently, he is advancing in pixel streaming for web Unreal Engine and mastering Angular, Spring Boot, and AWS Cloud. Funny also plays a key role in Sencha Select Partnership technical evaluation team. And at last, we have uh, Naz. Uh, he is a distinguished expert in the field of technology and uh, focus on integrating, integrating advanced digital solutions into various industries. His experience spans over across 3D visualization, real-time web technologies, and innovative application development. Naz, Naz's uh, deep understanding of these areas will provide uh, valuable insights 
into the practical applications and benefit of pixel streaming using Unreal Engine. So, all right, let's get started. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Anjali. So, uh, you know, the first question uh, that I would ask is, you know, why distribute your 3D solutions via the web? Right. And just kind of really two plain and simple things that are out there, accessibility and reach. And, you know, when we th think about that in terms of accessibility and reach, what are we what are we really saying? Uh, and first of all, it's global accessibility. Right. We've got, uh, you know, web distributed 3D solutions that can really be accessed anywhere in the world. Uh, by a really wide audience, right? Because what's essentially happening here? You're really your user. You're really is you is really accessing it from any device via web browser. So if you got a web browser, it doesn't require any uh, hardcore architecture, right? You don't have to have some uh, high-powered GPU sitting there running on your device to be able to use it. You basically you run it through a web browser. So you need a good connection, as we'll talk about later. But basically, you have a lot of access to this uh, technology. So um, the, 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 the key here that I want to emphasize too, and I, I really think this is a big one, right? Again, as I've mentioned, is um, when we think about gaming, we think about 3D and all these different technologies, right? You just tend to go right to, wow, what kind of hardware am I going to have to use, right? And, and here, again, you don't really have to have specialized hardware uh, you have to have a, a basically a device that can run a, a modern browser, right? And if you got that, then you've got access. So global accessibility is a big thing. And then in terms of ease of, depo ease of uh, deployment, um, the benefits uh, is that you get instant updates. So, and that means lower distribution costs compared to traditional software distribution, right? So you make an update and when you make that update, that update's out there and it's it's going to whomever is, is, is doing the, uh, the pixel streaming, right? So it's instant updates and patches, that's lower distribution costs. And, and really you, you don't have to say, okay, you need to update your app to X version, right? To get uh, folks uh, the new version of your software is just out there and instant for them. And then the other thing is, is uh, you know, user engagement. So with 3D experiences, what they're immersive and those can lead to higher, uh, you know, higher user engagement and really retention, right, are the big thing. So interactive and immersive experiences and a human, uh, or sorry, a higher user retention rate are huge things there in terms of being able to provide this kind of experience to even a user that doesn't have, again, that doesn't have that specialized hardware even. So again, you've got, you got more accessibility and more reach for your application. And then the other big thing is uh, scalability, right? You're going to run this on a cloud-based. If you run this on a cloud-based solution, uh, you've got really just seamless scalability that allows you to, to really uh, handle just varying workloads because it's cloud-based, right? So cloud-based gives you good scalability so you can scale up or scale down depending on what kind of workloads you have. Uh, so it really gives you the full, um, really the full capability of having a cloud-based solution to be able to scale your application. So you don't have to then think about, well, let's make the next update and we're going to have to have the user buy, you know, another and the latest modern uh, PC with, you know, some really expensive, uh, you know, uh, GPU sitting on it, right? Now, I'm not opposed to having a nice machine with a good CPU. I'm all about that. And certainly as Najem and Fani talk to you, uh, you know, there's trade-offs to doing this uh, this type of solution as well, right? And I'll kind of hit some of those uh, in a bit as well. But suffice it to say, this is a really good way. And Najem, he'll talk about some common use cases for this. Uh, but it's a really good way to get your users some nice high-fidelity uh, you know, views of your application without demanding them to have some special hardware. So, and again, if you got a browser, uh, you've got access to this. And uh, and we'll dig into those specifics and a little more technical detail on, you know, how this runs. It runs on WebRTC. So the, the team, uh, Najam and Fani, will go through those details pretty thoroughly. And then I'll come back to you and we'll talk a little bit about security and kind of uh, the things that uh, we need to think in terms of pixel streaming uh, when it comes to uh, to security. And then we'll wrap up with kind of talking about what are the trends of 3D uh, pixel streaming as well. So Najem, he's going to 
come up next and he's going to give you a, a, an overview of pixel streaming and uh, kind of come up with some, uh, so show you some, some common use cases for it and then even take you through a pretty cool uh, demo of it as well. So Najam, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, so um, before I uh, sort of uh, go over pixel streaming, I just want to give a brief overview of the real-time 3D and the web landscape. Um, so what's going on there? Um, first off, we have uh, the technology called a WebGL. Um, so essentially, what this does is that your application, so is actually, uh, so your 3D application can actually run on the, on the browser. Um, it's not like it's being, it will be streamed to the browser. It will be running inside the browser. So um, there are frameworks or game 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 frameworks or game uh, engines which actually uh, you know support webgl uh, are uh, i mean they are actually uh, from the ground up based on webgl like for example you have play canvas and then there is the 3js uh, javascript library and there's also other tools like so we have needle tools uh, which essentially uh, what they do is that they have this uh, uh, i mean it's a, it's a it's a unique concept in in the sense that what they are doing essentially is that if you have a, a unity based development unity the game engine um Instead of having to export to WebGL, what they will do is that they will create a mirror version of the, of the application uh, using 3JS. So that way it will be more performant because uh, it's not like you're using some sort of like a, um, you know, um, basically like an abstraction over what you have. Um, so essentially it's, it's as if you made this thing from the ground up using 3JS, um, which is more performant than, you know, making something in Unity and then exporting it um, to WebGL. Um, but essentially, um so so that's webgl which is which is actually you know the the application running on inside the browser um, um the uh, the main drawback to this is that because it's running in the browser um um fidelity wise you won't get like super high fidelity you won't get bleeding edge um graphics um so that is a concern for uh, a lot of use cases, especially, for example, if we have a core configurator kind of application where you want people to really see the actual, you know, the to the people want to see the car, um, which actually mirrors the real world counterpart as closely as possible, right? So something like that requires um, cutting edge graphics, um, which obviously something like this, um, I mean, you can sort of approximate it, but it won't really, you know, get you there. Um, but then there might be other use cases which will require sort of more realistic um, graphics, which again, this won't be able to do. But then there's another aspect, which is uh, like, so this is the GPU aspect and then the CPU wise, obviously this is uh, JavaScript based, right? So obviously compared to something like Unreal Engine, which is, you know, using C++, um, obviously it won't be as performed. Um, but then, yeah, so this is basically the WebGL. Um, and then the another, thing uh so basically this is one option option a and then we have option b which is um sort of the this new technology of uh streaming uh so basically streaming your 3d application over the internet and there's a couple of uh like different uh variants of that uh, so uh maybe you might have heard of cloud gaming so uh you have a couple of companies providing cloud gaming services like for example you have xbox cloud gaming you also have uh, Geo Games Cloud. This is available in India, and <clears throat> Nvidia offers uh, GeForce Now. So um, there, there, there are also other services, like for example, Sony has their uh, PlayStation uh, sort of cloud gaming service. Um, and then Nvidia also has another one uh, specifically for XR. Um, actually, this is more, uh, I mean, to be more precise, is for VR, virtual reality. Um, so they call it Cloud XR. And then uh, finally, pixel streaming, which is uh, Epic Games uh, version of this tech. Um, so Epic Games is the company who uh, you know who own Unreal Engine, um, who are behind Unreal Engine. So um, so this is basically their implementation or their version of this tech. Um, so uh, yeah. So explaining it a bit further than that. Um, so what is actually happening here? Um, we are essentially uh, streaming interactive. Uh, 3D applications. Obviously, you could also do 2D, but really, what's the fun in that? So, really, the the core benefit here is you know having photorealistic 3D applications, which are also interactive, and you can stream them to any device which has, like Scott said, a modern web browser. 
and it could be a, it could be uh, any kind of uh, any laptop you know it doesn't have need to have any kind of uh, super high end gpu uh, it could be a smartphone like a low end smartphone um, as long as uh, it has a web browser support um and then you can interact with the application which is the which is the key thing here it's not just a video being streamed uh, but you can actually interact with it and then um so essentially you are seeing um the rendered frames um and then this is the video and also the audio so it uses uh, webrtc behind the scenes so it uses uh, this tech for real time communication and then you're getting the uh, audio and video you are sending the events the input events and then those are being sent to the server and then um, at the server we have the application the actual application uh, residing on the server which you know um, sort of takes those inputs and then responds accordingly and then obviously you get the update results and Pixel streaming um, is designed to be um, low latency and high, uh, and then video and audio wise. Also, there's some other data um, involved as well. So they want the streaming to be uh, high quality. So um, they this is uh, one of the core benefits uh, of pixel streaming. And then, like I said, yeah, it's used, it uses WebRTC, which is like a, a standard protocol. Um, so. Uh, advantages. Um, so one advantage which might not be immediately obvious is content protection. Um, and this is very important for enterprise customers. For example, if you have a product and you don't want you know to ship a version of it which is um, you know which users can take in a reverse engineer, right? You want it to be protected. Um, so you can use something like this because the actual application is running on the server. And it's being streamed as um, so. Basically, you're getting the uh, the video, right, and the audio, but you're you're not actually getting the the binaries, right? Uh, uh, I mean, the user is not getting the binaries, so that way your content is protected, right? Um, so uh, another benefit, obviously, is that um, you don't need to install. So the user does not need to install anything. The user does not need to download anything. As soon as they kind of launch it, they they will be able to kind of uh, experience it. Um, and you get high fidelity graphics and interactivity on all the devices. So you could have, like I said, a low end phone and you will get, um, you know, super high fidelity graphics, um, you know, photorealistic uh, graphics, which otherwise would not have been possible on that device. And then, um, it's free. So apart from the deployment costs, obviously deployment is something that funny will talk about more, but apart from those costs, um, it is free. You don't have to pay, uh, for the life, any kind of license or anything. And it also supports XR. So if you want to do a, a VR application on the web, so you can do that as well. Obviously, when it comes to challenges, um, you do need good uh, internet. You need high speed internet and stable internet. Um, and obviously, because uh, 3D applications require GPUs, um, so you would need cloud GPUs. And then cloud GPUs tend to be expensive. So that is some that is a consideration you have, you have to take. Um, so now I'm just gonna quickly sort of uh, show the pixel streaming in action. Uh, it's, it's gonna be a very uh, short demo, uh, but I think hopefully it'll get you uh, an understanding of, or you, you'll be able to visualize like uh, what is going on here. Just a second. <clears throat> I'm gonna hop over to Unreal. Um, so hope you guys can see my Unreal editor. Um, so, uh, obviously, this is the editor, um, and then this is the typical setup that you would uh, have. Um, but what we want to do is that we want to have this experience inside of the um, in the browser. So how do we do that? Um, like in production, actually, you would uh, take a build, obviously, and then you will have uh, some scripts running, which will which will start the server. And then essentially, uh, the core concept is that you have a server, and then we will talk more about it. But basically, you have a signaling server. And then <clears throat> that server, when it starts, it starts listening to a streamer, and then you start the application. That is the streamer, and it will stream to that uh, to a specific uh, IP address and the port. Uh, so uh, by default, it uses uh, eight 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 as the port for streaming. And then, and then then the server will route that to the browser. So um, so depending on what IP uh, you have chosen, right now I'm, I'm going to use localhost. So if, and I go to the localhost on the browser after the server has started and the streamer has connected. I'll be able to see this application being streamed uh, uh, to the browser. So, 
I'm gonna basically launch the uh, server and then, so you should be, uh, okay, so you might not be able to read this, but basically uh, we we just uh, started a server. So it says started WebSocket server. And then um, it's, it's, so it's this local host uh, address 127.0.0.1. And the port number is 8888. This is for the pixel streaming. Um, and then the actual for, uh, IP address for the browser. Uh, I mean, it's the same IP address, but a different port, which is 80, which is the default port. So uh, obviously this is running locally. So this will be local host. Um, so I'm gonna now start the actual uh, application. So uh, essentially this is the streamer, okay? So this will be um, connecting to the server um, and, and and this is uh, running headlessly, or you could say like it's basically running off screen. And this is the same setup that you will do in production, where um, on the server you don't need to render it, right? So it will be rendering <clears throat> off screen, or it will be running headless. And then actually, you know, you'll get it on the on the browser which is connected, um, the actual uh, uh, graphics or visuals. So here it says now, yeah. So WebSocket client connected. Um, so streamer connected. Okay, streamer WebSocket connected. So what I can do now is that I can go to my web browser. Um, I can go to the localhost uh, IP. I can uh, specify the port 80 or, I mean, I don't need to, it will still go to the same thing. Uh, this is the default port anyway. So, um, and then I click start and you can see the application is running in the browser. So essentially the same setup will be done in production. And, and I think uh, if uh, you guys are familiar with web development, so, because if, if I have a smartphone and it's uh, basically uh, connected to the same Wi-Fi network, um, I could you know just take the IP address of my machine, which is you know running the server, and then I will get the same result on my uh, phone because you know it's connected to it uh, locally. So essentially, uh, yeah, I mean this is a local setup, and production in production it'll be uh, sort of a similar concept. And you can see like I'm right now I'm interacting, I'm basically sending commands to this uh, car, I'm controlling the car. Hopefully, don't crash it. Um, and then I'm right now. I'm using a keyboard, and you can also uh, use obviously you can use mouse. I'm just gonna. Uh, so there are some settings as you can see um, that you can modify. Um, these are by default um, present with this uh, sort of a front end. This is the default pixel stream front end, and you can uh, customize this as well if you want. Um, I'm just gonna go to the. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna keep my mouse forward at all times and I'm gonna uh, so we have a weather system here just want to you know maybe make it a little nicer uh, I'm gonna just amp up the fog and then be yeah. yeah, just to you know, make it a little more interesting um, and yeah essentially I mean so graphics like this on a browser uh, uh, yeah it's it's close to impossible um I, I mean I, I would say it's impossible because uh, you, there's at this kind of a frame rate and then at this performance. And as you can see, like the, the reflections are real time. Um, this is not baked, lighting is real time. Reflections are real time. Um, so something like this on a browser, no way, okay. I mean, using WebGL, uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's not, uh, I mean, at this, so using WebGL at this fidelity, at this performance, uh, it's not possible. Um, so, so yeah. That's why um, this option is being explored by a lot of uh, customers uh, for their um, gaming as well as non-gaming use cases. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that actually uh, next. Um, I'm gonna just exit out of here. So this is running um, in the background. I think that's fine. I can exit it. Um, I'm just gonna stop the server and I'm just gonna resume my presentation. Um, so just going to talk briefly about the typical use cases. So obviously, uh, the, uh, use case that is the most obvious is, uh, games, right? So you can have games on the browser. Obviously you can have games on the browser, but now you can have, um, games, which are like current gen, like, uh, something that you might see on PS PlayStation five or, you know, modern PCs on the browser, which, you know, uh, you cannot do um, yeah, with, uh, with just WebGL. So you can have uh, bleeding edge graphics, um, high fidelity, and you can have this on the browser. And this is something that, uh, like I said, the 
Xbox Cloud Gaming also kind of does the same kind of a concept, uh, but basically this is under Engine's version. Um, so apart from games, um, there are other use cases as well, obviously. Um, there, a lot of companies are using this for their uh, product configurators, for example, uh, curve configurators. So using this, you can actually get um, a very, um, a very realistic version of the car, of the car that the customer is trying to sell inside the simulation. And then the customers can look at it, they can customize it, right? And then, you know, they can book it. So um, they'll be able to, you know, look at the car and in very high detail kind of examine it and then, you know, choose kind of customize and then choose whatever they want to customize. Um, and apart from that architecture resolution, so same concept, basically, they want to, they, they want to see something which resembles the, re, the real world counterpart, same as the car, right? But in this case, it's buildings and architecture. Um, so you, uh, you can have customers who, you know, they want to sell something to, um, you know, potential clients. And then before selling the, the, the client, may want to visit the site, right? So this way, they'll get a very realistic experience on the browser without needing a graphics card. Um, and then AI avatars is another kind of emerging use case, which is where you have a photorealistic human in uh, in the browser. And then obviously there's also AI ML side of the things. This is, So apart from the graphics side of things. Um, so, but you have like a very photorealistic human being. Um, it's really good lighting. Um, and he, he is basically talking to the user and then responding to the user. And that's a very sort of a um, very, novel kind of a concept, but also, uh, you know, that's being explored right now. Um, and then finally, like before, uh, you can have games, you can also have simulations. So if you have gaming use cases, you can also have non-gaming uh, simulations. Uh, like for example, what we are using it for is uh, a, a product called Grid. And so that is essentially a simulation running inside the cloud. Um, so, uh, users don't need to basically, you know, um, download it uh, or need any kind of specialized GPU. They can uh, sign up and then they, they'll be able to stream uh, high fidelity in, uh, simulations uh, to the browser. And yeah, at this point, I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Funny uh, to, to go a little more deep into this. Funny, over to you. Thanks, Nizam. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the session. Hope everybody is able to see my screen. <clears throat> yeah, we can see it. Great. Okay, so uh, pixel streaming uh, compound, as Anasim has uh, already covered about it, uh, I'd like to just uh, reiterate a bit about it. Mm. So pixel streaming is a server or component which helps us to, you know, uh, render this uh, 3D applications, a huge GPU intensive uh, 3D uh, visualizations, uh, simulations of the gaming engine games on the browser. So the lightweight devices like the end users uh, desktop or the mobile devices with no computation, which is offloading this uh heavy computation uh requirements to the uh, cloud servers or the or the organization servers wherever the, the unreal engine instances are being running so which will as uh, najam has already demonstrated that uh on the browser having that real-time 3d interactive simulations where you can see the uh, high fidelity there there all this is being possible through the uh, pixel streaming uh so basically say so this uh, this also uh, avoids the installation of large softwares or heavy computation uh, resources requirements on the browsers which is already discussed so now let's try to understand how this pixel streaming what are the different components of this pixel streaming server which helps us to achieve this and we'll also talk about how you know uh, we can get this into production i mean as soon as I'm as demonstrated us how to run it on the local machine or the developer's machine. Now that is not enough for the application, any applications that we are developing, we need to get this deployed into production environment where a number of users, huge number of users would be using it where the performance, interactivity, and 
a lot of things comes into picture, the scaling part, like how do you serve a number of users, this kind of thing. So before getting into that, let's try to understand what are the different components uh, within the pixel stream uh, server. So here, as I've uh, depicted, there are the two major components that we should be thinking about when we talk about uh, a pixel stream. Here, one is a pixel streaming plugin within the uh, Unreal Engine uh, editor, on Unreal Engine editor on Unreal Engine uh, binary that actually comes out of as a production ready uh, simulation or a game, right? Which helps us to, which helps the encode the uh, video or the uh, uh, simulation uh, using H264 video compression so that it can be trans uh, transmission easily with uh, less bandwidth, right? And also uh, stream to the, the end user directly to the browsers. And the signaling web server is another component which will help like you know uh, to to render this video and whatever Najam has already shown us like the pixel streaming ui where the browser and different settings are available which can which you can configure so that you know the uh, visualization changes and the interactions the mouse or touch interactions on the mobile would go to the actual uh, unreal engine running on the server to serve its purposes. So this is where the uh, web server comes into picture where it has its own uh, HTML and JavaScript part of it to render this video part, uh, like uh, video part and the setting screen and etc. And signaling server is the other component within it, which helps us to, which helps to establish this connection between the Unreal Engine application and the browser or the HTML5 uh, video player or whatever is running in the browser. As soon as when the the in this case Nizam's case, as soon as uh, uh, Najim entered the URL like localhost eight triple eight, the web server is what it renders this HTML component, and then the signaling server starts establishing a connection between the uh, browser that is the HTML components rendered in the browser and the uh, Unreal Engine application running in his same uh, same machine. Coming to production, this can be happen. Uh, this can happen in a different servers as well. And the Unreal Engine can be running on a different machine or a different uh, uh, server. And the uh, Pixel Streaming server can be in the same server or a different server. But the communication. This is how the communication takes place. Now, apart from this, uh, we can also talk about there are two other components which helps to uh, improve the performance of the streaming part. That is turn server and the turn server STUN, the session traversal utilities for NAT server, like network address translation, which helps network address translation, meaning which helps us to identify the client uh, or the both the parties uh, who want to connect with each other, both the parties IP address and uh, ports and etc., which helps to establish the connection between these two peers. The key functionality of the server is like identifying the uh, or discovering the IP, establishing a, a connection and streaming the uh, streaming the video or the content with a minimal back bandwidth as the direct connection has been established between both. And the turn server is an, another uh, alternative uh, which is a sub, uh, which within the pixel streaming, which helps to act as a fallback mechanism uh, between the uh, browser and the browser <clears throat> The HTML part and the uh, Unreal Engine application running on the server, which acts as a mediator where it, the streams or the packets transfer uh, flow with uh, flow with the help of the turn server, where direct connection cannot be in. It can be a fallback mechanism where the direct connection, peer to peer connection, cannot be established between the browser and the uh, Unreal Engine application due to any reason, where it can act as an intermediary to transfer this data which ensures the connectivity between the browser as well as the uh, Unreal Engine application to a uh, smooth flow of the uh, video streams. Because it is uh, acting as uh, uh, intermediary, the intermediator, so the bandwidth usage will be more when compared to the stun server. Now, this is how it works. As you can see, the stun server uh, acts as a Stun or the turn server acts as a mediator between the desktop or the mobile web browsers and the pixel streaming plugin within the Unreal Engine application, which is being running. So once uh, within the local network or external, uh, I mean, the running on uh, an Unreal Engine application running on the servers and the customer accessing from outside the local network, 
because the stun server, if you enable a stun server, it tries to establish, identify the uh, public visible IP address and port of both the parties and establish a P2P connection. And if that is not possible by any case, the turn server can come into play. I um, mean, when you enable both of them again, when you enable both of them, the turn server can also come into the play where it uh, uh, acts as a intermediate between the two components to have this uh, streaming happening and interact interactions made on the browser to flow back to the uh, Unreal Engine within no time to uh, have that uh, manipulations on the screen. And now let's say with these two, two things, we have deployed the application, uh, the application, I mean, the Unreal Engine application, 3D app interactive application is accessible. But now once the application is published, definitely will not develop any application for a single user, right? Uh, when we're talking about stun server, uh, the or the turn server also, the Unreal Engine application running one instance can serve only one user at a time. When, the, especially the in the interactions case, where the interaction should manipulate the objects with a, within the 3D rendering, right? When you have more number of users, how do you manage this uh, uh, pixel streaming or uh, Unreal Engine application deployment? Is generally one you know, one way of doing that is you deploy multiple instances and multiple instances of pixel streaming and uh, uh, Unreal Engine application and have a load balancer or something like that, which will identify a round robin kind of mechanism to identify uh, which one is available and allocate that uh, to the uh, customer or the end user, whoever is accessing. That's one way of doing it. But then there is a, a uh, if, if the uh, uh, load balancer fails or it's if not able to identify the uh, available uh, instance of the Unreal Engine, then uh, the servers, there is a high, uh, good possibility of uh, end users not having access to the application or having uh, intermissions within the uh, within while, while accessing the application. So to solve that problem to some extent, Matchmaker Server is again one piece of code which is available within the Pixel Streaming Server that may not serve the whole purpose, but uh, it is one utility pro server available within uh, Pixel Streaming which helps us to which helps to identify. Uh, when you're running n number of instances, let's say five Unreal Engine applications uh, being run on the server, this matchmaker helps to identify to which browser, which uh, Unreal Engine application should be uh, asso associated uh, so that it can serve the uh, that particular uh, customer till the user is, till the customer is utilizing or accessing that application. So this matchmaker server will have the metadata of the Unreal Engine applications running and also when the customer requests, uh, I mean end user browser requests for a pixel streaming uh, service or uh, Unreal Engine application service, uh, first the request comes to the matchmaker which will identify the, uh, from using the metadata that is available, it will identify which uh, signaling server or web server is available to address this request and routes the request to the particular uh, a signaling web server from there on the signaling and web server will take care of uh, serving the browser serving the web browser that from where the request has been served but one of the disadvantage with this is let's say if you have uh, five unreal engine instances are running then and you have only two customers using example this is a hypothetical case uh, and just uh, example use case that only two people two users are using the application then rest of the five uh, oh. rest, Sorry, really sorry. Funny, can you please reshare your screen? Oh, it's not being shared. No, no, no. so uh, can you just uh, stop the slide for once, uh, Funny? Uh, and then kind of start again. Is it fine now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Go and then start the slides for them. Okay. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah. Let me make sure. It is fine, right? It's yeah. Hard. It's yeah. yeah, so the disadvantage with this is uh, when you have less number of users, still the uh, uh, dedicated number of uh, Unreal Engine instances will be running in. And if you have example, five Unreal Engine instances running and you have 10 uh, customers trying to access the application, only five out of them can be uh, accessed successfully and rest of the five uh, users would be unhappy with the service. So. To make it more uh, scalable and you know serve more customers, we mean we need to 
you uh, come up with some auto scaling kind of mechanism with the help of matchmaker server where matchmaker server uh, can help us identify that you know there is a sixth request for which i don't find any uh, available signaling web server so that the uh, auto scaling mechanism which you come up with maybe within the uh, within your uh, on prem servers whatever the auto scaling uh, mechanism that you have or if you go with the cloud it has its own uh, based on the type of cloud that you are using they have their own auto scaling services so matchmaker could be the uh, the pipe to enable this auto scaling in terms of scaling up and scaling down the instances now i mean as we discussed how to scale up and scale down with the help of matchmaker so coming to the deployment part uh, the pixel streaming uh, server can be deployed on on premise where you can have complete uh, control over customization in terms of instances in terms of uh, uh, network configurations or anything that you want to you'll have a complete control on the resources as the servers are local and you have the complete control where you can fine tune to the specific needs uh, that you have um, and the other approach you can have is obviously cloud deployment here i've discussed about aws azure or gcp with the prominent or public clouds available where the these clouds provide their own way of scalability uh, scalable uh, managed solutions and uh, high effective scalable solutions in uh, respect to infrastructure available so you, we can utilize those services uh, managed services to uh, deploy our pixel streaming and have this uh, full-fledged scalable and performant uh, pixel streaming application deployed and uh, there are other cloud services as well which are dedicated to the pixel streaming uh, as a service uh, services like vonage rfave uh, rest of them etc where you maybe you don't need to manage uh, all this within the within them as well they take care of data scaling but uh, at their end without any manual intervention. Uh, here I've taken a, a, similar, a small example uh, how do we take care of this overall deployment with a performant and scalable solution within AWS. Here, uh, the simple example available uh, where matchmaker server will not be util utilizing or we cannot be not using the matchmaker server available within the pixel streaming server, but the combination of Amazon SKS, Amazon uh, DynamoDB, and the Lambda will help us to make this uh, matchmaker uh, server. As discussed, matchmaker is server is nothing but which has the metadata of the instances running, uh, underlying instances running on the server, uh, on the cluster, and uh, it maintains like which instance is available, which is, uh, what instance is dedicated to which user. So if you see the flow, as and when the customer uh, or the browser makes a request to the API gateway, the API, API gateway will forward the request to Amazon SKS to address the request within the within a specific order. As and when the Amazon SKS gets a request, the Lambda would be invoked, which would identify, uh, which which would uh, request a DynamoDB or get the data from my DynamoDB about which instance is available uh, to uh, address address the specific request. Uh, and if the Amazon DB, I mean, if the, uh, any, any of the instance is not available, then Lambda would request the auto scaling group uh, within the VPC available in AWS to uh, instantiate one more uh, instance of Unreal Engine by fetching the assets from the AWS S3 or, you know, if it is a Docker, we, we can make a Docker of as well. The Docker can be pulled in from the uh, AWS ECR and one more instance can be uh, spawned up. <clears throat> then the once the instance gets spawned up, the Amazon DynamoDB would be get, would get updated with the metadata of that. Once this gets uh, available, uh, Amazon API will get Amazon API gateway would know about the new available instance uh, and serve the uh, browser with the new instance available. This way, uh, the auto scaling group as it is configured as uh, within the metadata uh, within the Amazon DB metadata maintained if it identifies we can also customize the group where if the load is less and more number of instances are uh, available without serving the uh, any any of the customers then we can scale down the instances as well to reduce the cost so using this this i've just taken an example of aws but this similar thing can be done with the respective services available in the other cloud uh, environments as well like azure and gcp 
Uh, so maintaining this VPCs for uh, reduce the uh, you know uh, data transfer costs and having an auto scaling tool uh, to scale up and scale down to utilizing the instances uh, or the resources effectively and as well as yeah uh, uh, VPC uh, and uh, choosing the right instances or uh, to run this Docker images or or Amazon uh, sorry. Uh, Unreal Engine instances, we can reduce the cost and still make the uh, application serve more people, uh, more customers with a better performance. And the other problem that we would come up with uh, is uh, latency. Generally, we have seen like, uh, I mean, we initially when we started uh, doing this uh, pixel streaming with the 3D, I mean, Unreal Engine, we have seen uh, latency issues. Uh, basically, this happens because running on the uh, local machines or even on the cloud machines we, when we don't know how to use a pixel streaming or the what are the better ways to use this pixel streaming like let's say if you don't use a stun server or a ton server right with the help of just pixel a signal server the latency would be little low when compared to stun server as discussed stun server would try to establish a peer to peer connection where you know with the less bandwidth the application can be served very well compared to you know having a turn or a a simple signaling server apart from uh considering or taking care of all this we also need to make sure that proximity uh, to the users is closer like let's say if your users are in a specific geographical location we would uh, we should deploy our uh, pixel streaming servers in that geographical area like for example we're in uh, india so we deploy our uh, pixel streaming servers on mumbai region so that the customers within india can access the uh, pixel streaming i mean the application uh, with uh, less latency whereas if i deploy the pixel streaming server on the i have any other region like frankfurt or uh, us east or west but definitely the latency would would be more where user would not feel comfortable using the application and we can also other way other one is efficient compression algorithms i mean we can uh, use the advanced compression algorithms uh, like uh, to reduce the packet size, which increase the trans uh, transmission speed between the Unreal Engine and the uh, pixel streaming application, which would also uh, reduce the latency in the terms. And network optimization, we should make sure that uh, our in application is uh, available within the high bandwidth, and as well as the customers or whoever is using the application, trying to access the application, should also be uh, on the high bandwidth or as much as good bandwidth available. Uh, so that uh, the traffic can be uh, real time and the latency can be reduced. And uh, client side prediction is another mechanism where you know uh, you anticipate, predict how users can interact and uh, what are the interaction uh, points within the application so that uh, you know uh, we uh, your application is prepared for it to. Uh, have that interactions or the response to that interactions with uh, less data being transferred within the uh, from the browser to the application as well as from uh, application to the browser so these are uh, this way also the latency can be reduced or user did not yeah the application network latency or the performance of the application can be reduced so these are the four uh, different uh, techniques that we can uh, follow to uh, reduce the latency and deliver a smooth experience to the user when uh, user is using our underlying application, interactive application. Uh, with this, I would uh, uh, complete uh, my part and hand it over to uh, Scott uh, to take over on the help us understand the security considerations and trends. Scott. Good, good. Hey, thanks, Fani. Uh, good, uh, good explanation of how of how all this works. And you know, as, as we we think back through the diagrams and the flows uh, in order uh, of Fani's presentation and how uh, really a session gets set up, right? And and essentially underneath what this is really kind of riding on is it's uh, WebRTC. So you're you're basically you have a WebSocket, a secure WebSocket uh, underneath all of that. And when we think about in terms of, of security, and and I'll be brief because obviously security is um, you know there's quite a bit when it comes to security to discuss, and I'll just kind of briefly mention some of these. 
Um, and, and really some areas we want to focus on, you know, we kind of got three of them highlighted there. I'll dive into each of those a little bit. Data encryption, secure transmission, then, you know, user authentication and access control, and then regular security uh, audits and compliance. Um, if we talk in terms of, of data encryption, you know, like pretty much any other application, right, we have to worry about, you know, how's the data encrypted both, um, you know, at rest, so when it's stored and it's sitting on a server somewhere, and then how's it uh, encrypted and secured when you actually transmit uh, that message over the, uh, you know, over the internet. So when we think about encryption, you know, we think about things like TLS and SSL encryption, right? Um, and pretty much any any transmission like this needs TLS involved. Matter of fact, uh, most of these protocols that are sitting in the upper layers of this depend on TLS to be there even. Uh, but specifically to pixel streaming or, or really to WebRTC, there's a couple of things that I would pay attention to. And uh, one of those being SRTP, which is Secure Real-Time Transfer Protocol, uh, Transport Protocol. Uh, and that's that's essentially used to encrypt media streams uh, like WebRTC-based pixel streaming uh, that we're talking about today. And that really provides us with secure audio and video transmissions. And then <laughs> you also have uh, something called DTLS, and that's Datagram Transport Layer Security. And uh, this is a, a protocol that's designed uh, to provide security for that datagram based for datagram based type applications and that's just going to ensure that you got you know confidentiality integrity authenticity of the data and uh, and it's based on tls uh, which you know, again is pretty much widely used in in uh, securing connections web applications and so on and specifically with the web rtc uh, so but you just need to make sure those things are indeed in place and that that uh, that that web socket or web rtc is secured uh, through these protocols. Um, the other thing is just like really with any other application, you want to uh, make sure that you've got proper authentication and authorization mechanisms, right? And and that entails a couple of things, things like multi-factor authentication. Um, you know, that way it's, it, it, that often requires both users and administrators to access uh, streaming platforms uh, in a managed way, right? So in other words, you're going to have Multi-factors, uh, multi-factor authentication in place, so that you've got more, more than one, more than just write a password-protected uh, way to get in and access the application. But the other way too is to uh, to use RBAC, right? So role-based access control, and uh, that just ensures that you know you you have the necessary permissions to access specific resources you need, um, but you don't have accesses to areas you don't need, right? So it's just minimizing the risk of unauthorized access. Um, and then, you know, part of what you've seen with, with Fani there in terms of infrastructure security, there's things like firewalls and, 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 and you know, intrusion detect, uh, detection systems. Now, specifically, those, those firewalls, you know, when they're set up, you got to work around a lot of things when it comes to setting up, you know, stun and turn servers, right? So there's a little bit of configuration that has to take place there, but obviously your infrastructure needs to be secured. Uh, with those type of systems and uh, really just having a, a good secure uh, cloud infrastructure. If you're running it on one of these clouds like AWS or Azure or GCP, uh, you want to make sure that you take advantage of a lot of those built-in security things that come with things like VPCs, virtual private clouds, and uh, then those network security groups and, and controlled access that you have to, to the infrastructure. So specifically, if you're using one of those cloud resources, you want to make sure you're taking advantage of all those things that are offered. And th those big cloud providers provide a, uh, a good set of features to do that, uh, as well as those that may be specialized in pixel streaming as well. Now, you know, with any of this, all of this, these cloud service providers, they don't do all this for free. So all those kind of things have to be taken into consideration. And just in general, right, when we talk about IT architecture, there's always trade-offs and there's got to be good reasons that you go with, you know, with certain things. You're going with the cloud uh, versus doing an on-prem type thing, or even in this case, right, where we're, we're streaming, uh, we're, we're doing the, the pixel streaming versus running and, and using the hardware uh, locally, right? So there's advantages and disadvantages to both. And, 
you know, you, you had to think about things like applications where this, uh, where this pixel streaming would be used in order to realize the benefits of it, right? So total cost ownership is definitely a factor. And that also includes the, you know, the different uh, uh, security infrastructure that you got to put in place. And really, I don't say that specifically for, for uh, pixel streaming, that really just applies in general when you're working with an application and you've got to, uh, You've got data traversing, which you know, pixel streaming itself is a lot less data streaming than you would be, and and some applications for sure. But you still got to make sure it's it's secured at, at rest, encrypted, and and secured at rest and uh, and and in transit as well. Um, and and again, so again, data protection, uh, encryption at rest, regular security audits is a huge thing, right? So just making sure, first of all, an audit kind of implies that you already have a plan in place. So you need a good security plan and a good action plan uh, and a good mitigation uh, and, and risk plan involved. And you need to regularly go through those things. So that just needs to, any web application, really, you any application for that matter, you just need to go through regular security audits and making sure that you've got all your bases covered. Uh, because obviously there's some really sharp people out there that, uh, that, or uh, maybe at times using trying to use your your application in a nefarious way, right? So you want to make sure you're secured, and do all you can by having all those by having regular security audits. Um, and I think just a couple things before I wrap this up is just making sure too that you're properly monitoring and logging information. So you're you're logging anytime someone accesses the system. You're logging when certain events happen. That way you can really quickly detect and then respond to a possible security incident. And if one, God forbid, if one occurs that you've got information to go back and realize, you know, when that event occurred and what you need to do to mitigate it as well. Um, and then the last thing on that one, I would say, I don't really have it on the slide, but thinking about, uh, you know, deployment and, and configuration security. And, and when I think through that, I think about, you know, automated deployment tools. So, uh, tools like maybe AWS, uh, AWS cloud formation or Azure resource manager and those templates, and they're used to, to automate, um, uh, the secure deployment of infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, right? So you're kind of consistently doing that and making sure that every time you deploy, you, you deploy in a, a consistent way and in a secure way as, as well. So, uh, and then again, um, you know, in terms of, uh, scalability and load balancing type things uh, you've also got like Fani mentioned uh, matchmaker there and signaling uh, the signaling web server those are used to manage load balancers and uh, those can also be used um, to provide some security at, at that layer two uh, like HTTPS uh, type thing and, and, and enforcing that kind of thing at that level even so those are just a few things that uh, I think are in, in general what you have to worry about when you talk about uh, pixel streaming. And I'll kind of wrap up with this uh, quickly. And that's on the future trends and, you know, kind of the emerging trends. And, and uh, obviously there's, there's questions around why would you pixel stream as opposed to running things on a, a device? And I think it all depends, right? Again, it's, it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish with the, uh, with the application, with your business essentially. Um, but a few, a few future trends that we see, or just integration with uh, you know AR and VR. Um, you've got a lot of AI-driven personalization uh, that's there to tailor content for individual users. And then you know you've got enhanced realism with a more you know like things like real-time ray tracing. Uh, and and of course you know I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of folks who are if you're hardcore gaming and that kind of thing you're like well we're gaming we're doing cloud gaming and that sort of thing can't we just get a better experience on the phone? And I think it, again, it really depends. It really depends on what you're, what you're trying to do, and um, and you know what your audience is for that game, right? So there certainly may be situations where gaming is okay uh, to do uh, and, and pixel stream, and then certainly things like uh, that we've seen are, are things like uh, in the real estate industry where you can do some virtual walkthroughs and those kind of things. Those have um, provided pretty good results. And, and those aren't things that are that are like a gaming where you know people are gonna be on for hours and upon hours uh, to do those things. But when they have a need, they go out and look and, and kind of do walkthroughs for different real estate properties, uh, whether it's homes or businesses, uh, for example, but that's a, a business that we've seen uh, 
um, use uh, use these technologies specifically. So with that, um, I will turn it back over to, uh, you know, uh, first of all, just make sure, Fani, um, Najam, anything else before I turn it back over to Anjali? You guys good? Yeah. We're on, we're on time. Yeah. Okay. I think they're good. Okay. All right. Very good. Anjali, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Moving on to the Q&A session, please feel free to ask anything related to our discussion today, and we'll address your questions promptly. All right, so I think we've got kind of questions. Now I'm looking, and I think we've got questions in chat and yes. um, in the Q&A. So um, let's see. So Amar Sen is asking, like, uh, are, we, are we making Unreal Engine 5 work on web browser? Yeah, I mean, essentially, that is the idea. But we're not actually exporting the application to the web browser. Like uh, you might, uh, like Unity, for example, has this option of uh, exporting to WebGL. Um, and as I explained, uh, you won't get that uh, level of fidelity that you can get, obviously, when if it's running on natively on a GPU. Um, so what essentially uh, we do is that um, to get Unreal Engine on the browser, uh, we use this technology where the actual application is running um, still is still running natively on a, and it uses GPU. Uh, but what you are getting in the browser is a streamed version of that application. All right. So another one, Harry Brooks is asking, uh, can you please provide some concrete examples of how it's being put to work in fields like architecture and simulation? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we can give a very nice example for, uh, as far as simulation is concerned. I, uh, so we are working on a product uh, called Grid. Um, and I think, Funny, you want to kind of talk about that? Um, yeah. So it's a simulation. Yeah. Basically, as uh, Najam has already taken an example, uh, Grid platform is something that uh, where we are using where, you know, uh, the platform helps to generate uh, test data uh, or the test their, uh, you know, uh, the vehicles or the, drones on the real world scenarios instead of testing it on the real world uh, the simulation that we are developing uh, through the platform will help them to test their uh, you know programs uh, on the simulated environment and generated test data which helps them to you know uh, train their uh, devices like drones to perform the real operations that's one real world example that one you can talk about and another example which is not yet live, but we have done some uh, work for a real estate company, which helps, you know, uh, for their end customers to visualize how the upcoming project uh, is going to visualize in real time, instead of uh, directly visiting customer visiting to the site. Uh, the this simulation uh, is helping them, helping their customers to visit the site virtually and uh, help uh, take a quick decision on on the purchase or the transaction. There's a two right. real-time examples that we have done. We can talk about. Okay. All right. Uh, another question. Uh, so James Weber wants to ask, how exactly does pixel streaming make such super detailed 3D experiences more accessible to everyone? Because generally getting these kinds of graphics on the web has been a real challenge for him. Yeah, so... Um, uh, so basically is this almost the same question as before. So um, we are not actually running it on the browser. Um, it's running on a server, uh, which has a GPU, and then it's streaming to the browser. So that way we are able to achieve really good high fidelity graphics on the browser. Yeah. yeah. So as discussed throughout the session, this pixel streaming uh, is helping you to, you know, whatever is being rendered using the high uh, GPU, high end GPU machines, the rendering is frame. I mean, those frames are transferred to the browser, the like as if you know uh, the YouTube or Netflix videos are rendered on your browser. And uh, apart from that, the additional capability that Pixel Streaming has got uh, is like this interactions that are taking place on the browser, like user want to move the car to the left, right gem those interactions are also seamlessly transferred back to the unreal engine uh, application which is running on the servers which can you know uh, manipulate that object turning left or right and the same on the real time the frames are uh, 
transferred back to the browser, which is giving you a, a interactive real time experience. Hope that answered your question. All right. So uh, another one, Bella wants to ask, uh, what are some of the biggest headaches developers usually face when trying to do this? And how does pixel, uh, how does pixel streaming help them overcome those obstacles? Yeah, you want you want to take that up, Fanny? Um, yeah, so go being go some ahead. of the challenges. Yeah. So I mean, um, I'm I'm just gonna talk a little bit uh, from the Unreal Engine side of things, and then I'll let you, uh, Fanny, take over from the like from the actual production or deployment side of things. Yeah. Um. So, um, when you are developing an application, um, and you want you your target is to run it on, uh, you know, to basically deploy it via pixel streaming to the users. Distributed over the cloud, um, you still want to optimize your application. Um, so uh, basically, a nice rule of thumb is: um, imagine um, you are targeting uh, a console, like for example, the game uh, gaming consoles, right? Um, so gaming consoles have a specific uh, sort of uh, specs, and then you kind of take those into account because you have a specific um, server. Uh, or basically a specific machine specs uh, that you want to target. And then you keep that in mind when you're uh, building the application and optimizing it. So that is something, you know, that really helps, uh, you know, when you're finally uh, deploying it to the users. And then when you want to talk about some of the challenges you might face from the deployment side. Yeah, so how does pixel streaming help them overcome those obstacles is, you know, if, if pixel streaming is not in place, I mean, as Najam was taking an example with Unity uh, or, WebGL, right? This the the high fidelity was not there. Uh, if you convert that into WebGL kind of uh, application, whatever has been developed in Unreal Engine, those animations cannot be transferred high to or generated a uh, WebGL kind of solution, which can give that you know experience to the user. Uh, <clears throat> with the pixel streaming, streaming these uh, frames getting rendered on these GPUs with the same fidelity or the user exp uh, or the look and feel is transferred to the browser where, you know, without any high uh, end hardware or computational power, end user is able to experience that 3D visualization and as well as interaction. And when you're setting up pixel streaming, uh, general issues, you know, Obvious obstacles that would be followed as one, you know, uh, multiple users trying to access the application. Servers are not available. Uh, frequently, pixel streaming gets uh, disconnected because you're not you're not using turn server or stun server, right? And uh, as you're not, I mean, things like uh, network latencies are not taken care. So even though the pixel streaming has the capability because of this uh, improper uh, setting up of the uh, pixel streaming or your servers user would you know uh, not have a good experience with the application that you're trying to render so this kind of obstacles uh, pixel streaming with the help of this inner components that we talked about matchmaker stern turn this kind of components it makes it easy to you know uh, give a seamless experience to the users as of the engine application has been running in their local all right. So we have received few questions in the chat box as well. So Masood Khan wants to ask, the tech is very good and cool, but costing is the biggest issue. Just to show a product which is costing rapidly to the owner, how is it feasible? Uh, how is it how it is feasible make a point out of the product of, for the company? Uh, like he's talking about the virtual showrooms here. How to handle this part? What are the solutions? Again, the same, uh, obviously the, the Unreal Engine, to run this Unreal Engine, we need to, uh, we need a uh, high computational power like GPUs and uh, high-end high GPUs. The cost cannot be, you know, avoided completely. I mean, you cannot compare with any uh, web applications running on the server. The cost would be uh, too much, I mean, comparatively very high, but uh, following the best practices and the optimization techniques that few of them which we discussed in this session, uh, following those uh, our best optimization techniques, we should be, we will be able to reduce the cost uh, to greater extent. That if you're comparing the cost of this hardware or the services, cloud services with the web application, then maybe we are not comparing 
you know uh, apples with apples yeah we are comparing two different things yep yep yeah and you're definitely taking a little cost when you're you're doing this streaming so some of the yep. the main cloud providers or even you know even different services that specialize in in streaming unreal engine 2 are are, are things to look at too because the total cost of ownership is not only just Hey, loading it on there, you run it, it's managing the infrastructure and everything. So you really have to take a look at the big picture. So, and depend on where you're at in your business, do you have the resources to manage the infrastructure? Um, so do you need maybe one that's more on a hosted where they're going to take care of, a lot of uh, take care of a lot of those things for you, right? So it all uh, really has to be weighed out. And uh, certainly something we will help you walk through and help you get the best because uh, you know, we're we basically we are um, we're an IT solutions company. We're not a hosting company, so we help you look for whatever's best for you to to use, uh, whether that's one of the big cloud providers or a service even. Uh, but yeah, you just really have to look at total cost of ownership and and just realize what's out there. Uh, manage your own infrastructure, you know, comes at a price, right? It can be great, and sometimes it's very necessary. Um, but also if you don't have the, uh, the ability to manage it, then that's where you probably want to go with either getting someone to help you manage it, uh, or, or go to a, a service that already manages a lot of the infrastructure. So there's definitely a cost. There's no doubt, right? We, you're running GPUs like Najem, I think, and Fani have both, uh, both alluded to, and really what you're doing is you're, you're taking that part away from the device that's actually having to run. Uh, the system, right? So you're kind of, you're taking some of that cost. So you just, you have to really weigh out what you're doing with that and look at total cost ownership. And like Fani said, there's things, certainly architecturally, just using cloud cloud best practices, you can reduce the cost, but uh, but you're not going to, you're not going to do away with it, right? It's definitely, it's, it's, it's uh, when you're talking a, an application where you've got a lot of the load running on a device, um, there's no, you can't really compare those two, right? It's a totally different thing. Thank you so much to our incredible speakers, Scott, Pani, and Nazmo, for showing their expertise today. And a huge thank you to all of you for joining us. We hope you found the discussion insightful and inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.